it says g of x is the inverse of f of x. If I write that out mathematically, that's what that sentence means in math, is, is the equal sign. So g of x is the inverse of f. So there we go. Now, how do I get, how do I take f and find the inverse? So we have two steps to find inverses. So step one, you're going to start with y equals f of x. You're going to swap x and y. And step two, you're going to solve for y. So let's go ahead and find this inverse now. So I'm going to begin with y equals f of x, which is 4x plus 3. So step one, I'm going to swap where I see x and y. So I have x equals 4y plus 3. So that's step one, swap x and y. So step two, solve for y. So this easy algebra problem, subtract 3, and then multiply by a fourth or divide by 4. Once you solve for y, what you're looking at is f inverse. So that's f inverse of x. And of course, up above, f inverse of x is g of x. That's one of the first things I wrote down. So that's g of x. What is g of b? Requires no calculus knowledge. What's that? So, yep. Yeah, you're just going to feed it, put a b in there instead of x. That's all. So it's going to be b minus 3 over 4. So you're going to notice, especially in 7.1, that most of the difficulty you have is the actual notation and knowing what they're talking about. It's really going to be a major, the major issue is just figuring out the notation that you need to work with. So there's g of b. Now g prime of b. So this would be d over, normally it would be dx, but the variable is not x anymore. The variable is b. So this is a d db derivative. I think it will be easier to write it 1 fourth times b minus 3. I'd rather do my derivative in that form than that quotient form. So this is 1 fourth. The constant multiple rule says you can bring the fourth outside. Derivative of b minus 3. Derivative of b is 1. Derivative of a number is going to be 0. So we just get 1 fourth as our derivative. So any questions on this problem? I'm going to try to find a problem that the notation is a lot trickier because I found that most students have problems and when they have problems in chapter 7 it's because of the notation. This one was not too bad. The only tricky thing was writing this down right there. That was the only, what I would consider, tricky part of this problem. So this next problem is almost exactly the same. Compute g prime of x, where g of x is the inverse of. So that's pretty much the exact same problem, just slightly different function. Same problem. All right. This one looks a little bit different. They're asking for some more. 
All right, let g be the inverse of f. So I'm going to start by writing down what that means in math. It just means g equals f inverse. And our original f, it was a, I think a cubic x cubed plus 4x plus 7. And they asked for, so they said, don't find a formula for g of x, but let's ignore the instructions and see if we can just figure out what is the inverse of this function f. So we'll try the same approach, even though it says don't do it. We're just going to try the exact same approach we did before and try to solve, uh, find the inverse. So I want to find f inverse of x. So how do we do that? We start with y equals x cubed plus 4x plus 7. And we're going to swap x and y. So we have x equals y cubed plus 4y plus 7. Why is this difficult to solve for y, this particular equation? Why is this one way harder to solve for y than the last one we did? Cubic. So there's, if it was quadratic, we could go complete the square. And then y would show up in one spot. But this is not degree 2 or quadratic, it's degree 3. There are some crazy algebra tricks you can do to cubics but they're pretty tricky. So this one's not going to be easy to solve for y. I mean, I can do a little bit. I could subtract 7, give it a good shot. But what would be a good move to make from here? I could factor a y out. But that's not really going to get us really any closer to where we want to be. We still see y in two different places. So that's no closer to getting y in one spot. So that's my sad face when I realize I don't think it's going to work out. All right. So it's not wrong. It's just we're not, not going to be able to get the inverse without doing quite a bit of research on solving cubics. Uh, which I'm not familiar with all the cubic algebra out there. So we're going to skip that. Good news is the question never asked for what is g of x. It asked for what is g of 12 and g prime of 12. So they're very specific about 12 right there. So let's figure out what is g prime of 12. Or what is g of 12? We'll do that one first before we do any calculus. All right, so the first part of the question is what is g of 12? Well, what do I know about g of x? g of x is f inverse of x. So this is g of 12 is f inverse of 12. And if we think about the regular function notation, we would write y equals f of x. I'll write this down a little lower, actually. So normally, we'd use y equals f of x notation. And for those students who have taken my classes for a while, I use a triple equal sign to compare two equations when they mean the same thing. So what I'm going to do is move the function to the other side. And it appears as the inverse function like this. So this is going to seem a little bit weird at first if you didn't take my pre-calculus class where we did this a lot, especially with logarithms when we would use inverse functions. So a maybe easier to understand algebraic example. If I want to move the function to the other side, so the function here on the right side is take x and cube it. So what is the inverse function, or the opposite function of cubing? It would be a cubic root or a one-third power. 
So if I bring the, the function to the other side, it would look like x equals y to the one third power. So it's the same, tells me the same information. It's just the algebra, algebraically it's the same. It's just moving the function to the other side as the inverse function. You've done this quite a bit. You have an easier example. You could use a minus two function. So what function undoes subtracting two? Adding two. So that would be the same as y plus two equals x. So we move the minus two function to the other side as the inverse function. So you've done this before, you just probably didn't see it laid out like this. So this is just a little refresher down here. You've been doing this stuff for a while. This at the top, this is the notation that I want you to think about it with, is this notation here. And it's a little silly to use a triple equal sign. The reason that you have to use a triple equal sign, a double equal sign doesn't work. Let me write down some bad math down here. If I use a regular equal sign, it tells me some extra information that I don't want. It also tells me that x minus 2 equals y plus 2. So it's saying that too many terms are equal. What I really want to do is compare the equations. And that's not good to use an equal sign to compare equations. Because equal sign is, means something very different inside of an equation. So that's why I go with the triple equal sign to compare equations. OK, with all that notation, let's think about what's actually happening here. So I want to know what's f inverse of 12. So if I think of this uh, function output, I could use the letter y or x here. It doesn't matter. So I'm just going to use, we'll go uh, y. Actually, it doesn't matter. Let y equal f inverse of 12. And now what I'm going to do is move the function to the other side. So this is the same as f of y equals 12. So I just took the function and moved it to the other side as the inverse. So any questions on that idea? So I want to know what is f inverse of 12. But I don't really know much about f inverse. I know things about f. They tell me exactly what the f function is right there at the top. So if I can rewrite the problem in terms of just the function f, I'll be a little bit closer to, um, hopefully, a little closer to figuring out what y is. So now I have f of x at the top of the screen. I'm just going to plug in y wherever I see x. Quadratic formula is not going to save you here. Oh, that should be a y, not an x. So let's go ahead, let's collect our constants. Let's put them on, I don't really know what side would be best to put them on. Let's subtract 7 to the other side. So we got 12 minus 7 is 5. Now, the original problem never told us this function was 1 to 1, uh, but they did say it has an inverse, so it better be 1 to 1. And what that means, what we're looking at here, we're saying what input has an output of 12. So what input to the function f gives me an output of 12? Because it's 1 to 1, there should be one input maximum that gives me an output of 12. And hopefully, it'll be a really nice number. One looks like it works, just luckily, not because I'm good at algebra. I'm just looking at that and saying, I think one makes it true. Not a stroke of genius, just I'm just looking at it and basically getting lucky at the guess. Uh, here's where you could graph this and see where it would be 5 if you graphed it. Uh, but solving cubic is not very easy. So you either kind of see it or you don't, basically. 
Another way you could write this, subtract five, and you can use a rational zero theorem on the polynomial. So you got degree three polynomial, the zeros are potentially plus minus one and plus minus, I think five would be the other one, not one fifth. So that would be the rational zero theorem would tell you try those four right there. So y equals one is a solution. So what was y? y is something I invented right up here. Let y equal f inverse of 12 and y is one. So we got f inverse of 12 is one. So this problem, I think, makes the notation, it makes, you need to use the right notation to answer this question successfully. Like none of the algebra I did on the board was too difficult. It was just all about the notation and keeping track of what's f, what's f inverse. So this was the algebraic part of that question. Now the second part was calculus. What's a derivative of, I think, f inverse of 12? So g prime of 12. So I could write this as f inverse prime of 12, but of course it's a horrible way to write it. So I much prefer it written like that. So I don't like to put a prime next to an inverse function. If you have to, you definitely want to go with parentheses and make sure your prime has a little bit of a lean to it so it doesn't look like a one. So I like to, if it's going to appear anywhere close to a one, I like to make sure that it has a little bit of an angle on it. Well, this, we do have a formula for this. This is the, I think the only formula we looked at or got last class. So let's jump to inverse functions. Somewhere in here, here we go. That's what we got at the very end. So this is our inverse derivative right here. The only difference is we're gonna put 12 wherever we see an x, basically. That's the only difference. So I'll write down the original formula. F inverse of x. So in calculus one, what did you learn about plugging in constants and derivatives? About the order you do it? Yeah, so we're definitely gonna do that when we're taking a derivative. But what happens if I plug in constants before I take a derivative? What do I get? Zero. Zero. Uh, the good news is I'm not taking a derivative I haven't really taken a derivative, I've just applied the derivative uh, formula for this. At some point I will go and take a derivative, but not quite yet. Let's look at what we wrote down. F inverse of 12, that's the same as g of 12. That's what the F inverse function is, is g. What is F inverse of 12? We just figured that out. So that was one, somewhere right over here. Where do we get that? F inverse of 12 is one. So I'm using this right there. So F inverse 12 is one. So I'm gonna make that substitution. All right, I still have not taken any derivatives yet. Now all I need to do is figure out what is f prime of one. Good news is I know the f function and it's super easy to take a derivative of that function. So regular f of x was x 
cubed plus 4x plus 7 maybe, plus 4x plus 7. And now I need to know, so <clears throat> if I plugged in 1 and figured that out and then took a derivative, I would get 0 for sure. So here's where I'm actually taking a derivative on this step. So I should not be plugging in 1 right now. I should be finding the derivative and then plugging in 1. So here's the place where order is super important. So our derivative is 3x squared plus 4. Finally, I can plug in 1 into f prime. And we get 7. So f prime of 1, we just figured out was 7, which is the derivative of g of 12. So none of the algebra I did was difficult. None of the calculus I did was difficult. The difficult part was keeping track of everything and putting it all together. So you're going to find that that is the main difficulty with this section right here in 7.1. So hopefully your other homework questions go in a really similar manner to this right here. You just want to pay attention to what they're talking about. So when they say g is the inverse of f, you want to write down g of x equals f inverse of x, and then know that those are the same. So that should get you started on your homeworks. And your first quiz is going to be on Friday, and it will definitely cover 7.1. So there's a really good chance I'll put a question similar to one of these homework problems on your quiz, depending on how far into 7.2 we get. Uh, I, may, I may put 7.2 on your quiz also. So if I finish, whatever I finish on Wednesday could be on your quiz on Friday. So I think we've done enough example problems from 7.1. So let's jump in. Let's jump into 7.2. So I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is you know all the properties of natural logarithm already, or at least you should know almost all of them. I'm also going to post up some review questions. They're going to be from section 1.5. Or I think, or 1.5. So you'll see them pop up right next to 7.1 homeworks. And they're just going to be a review from what you did in pre-calculus class, like the different rules for exponents and logarithms. So it'll be things, uh, all the ones you remember, hopefully, like uh, multiplying bases is the same as adding powers, and then the more obscure, like powers of powers or products of powers, and all the logarithm ones that hopefully you didn't forget. So there's a bunch of ho review homeworks that review what you did in pre-calculus class. I am going to write down, we'll, we'll get to the properties in this class, but I'm not going to do too many questions about applying the properties to different homework questions. So that'll be, I gave you homework problems for that. Uh, what we're going to do now, and what you've never seen before, is actual definition of a natural log. So you probably saw exponential functions explained where like 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2. And then what is the log base 2 of 3, you've written, seen as the inverse of an exponential function. Uh, but you haven't really seen what exponential functions are when it doesn't have an integer power. It's pretty easy if it's something is cubed, what you do, but what if something is taken to 2 and a half power, uh, or even something more obscure like a pi power? What does that mean? Uh, so what we're going to do is look at what actually is an exponential function, but before we can even do that, we have to learn what actually is a logarithm, a logarithmic function. So here's the definition.
Now there's many reasons you haven't seen this before, mainly because this wouldn't make any sense until last qu the end of last quarter is the first time that this would make any sense. You can't show this to somebody in pre-calculus class and expect them to get it. All right, what in the world does this even mean? I mean, the left side means natural log of x, but what does that right side symbol mean? So it's an integral, and those are the lower bound and upper bound. So integral means area under a curve of what function? The 1 over t function from 1 to whatever in the world x is. And x can be anything that's 0 or more. Or no, anything. You can't use 0, anything bigger than 0. So let's draw a nice little graph here of the 1 over t function. It's pretty easy to draw. So is the function 1 over t at 1, when t is 1, our output value is also 1, so we get that point on the graph. If we go over to 2, our output value would be 1 half. If I went to 3, it would be a third. If I went to 1 half t value, I'd be way up. It's not quite to scale. That would be way up at 2, just be the reciprocal. So area under the graph, we're going to start at 1 right here. Now let's say x is bigger than 1. So that means we're going to start at 1 and go to the right. So let's say x is somewhere over here. The area right here, how much area I just shaded in, is the natural log from 1 to x right there. So you can see when x is greater than 1, you get a positive value. If x is small between 0 and 1, you're actually going to go, uh, so I'll do that in blue. Let's say our x is small, like closer to 1 half, you would get this area, except the weird thing is you'd be starting at 1 and then going to the left. So what would that mean about your area if you integrate? with a starting at a bigger bound going to a smaller bound, but your area looks positive. It would be negative, yeah. So if, you, if the area looks positive and you're integrating like big x value to small x value, you're going to get a negative. Uh, and if things are positive and you go from a smaller x value to a bigger x value, you would get positive. So let's write down some of these properties. So when x is greater than 1, you're going to get a positive area under the curve. So your natural log will be greater than 0. When x is small between 0 and 1, natural log would be negative, because you would count that area as negative going to the left. So that leaves out. What about when x is 1? What is the area under the curve from 1 to 1? Zero. So that'll be 0. So it'll be a width 0 rectangle is the way to think about it. Doesn't matter how tall it is. This one's only height 1. But even if it was height 10,000, your width is 0. So you still have 0 as your area. So that right there is why natural log of 1 is 0. So what do you know about the number e? It sure does. And it's the natural base. So e is the natural base. How does e relate to the natural log function? 
the e the exponential function cancels out the natural log function but what e just as a number what happens if i feed natural log e so i get one as the output so what does that mean about e if we look back at our graph <clears throat> e is the number such that when you feed it into the natural log function you get out one or it is how far to the right you have to go so that the area you shade in is one so if we think about how much is uh, area of one i'll just do a little sketch outline of a one by one box right here that just gives you a approximate size on how much area one would be i just went up one and over one so that's a square of area one so if you look certainly from one to two that's not enough area to fill that box i need a little bit more how much more do i need uh, i think it's close to 2.71 is about how far you have to go over to hit e, to get e if you don't need to go all the way to three so it turns out e is between two and three Use a natural base such that. So it is a number such that, and the natural log of that number is one. So that is how E is defined. Now you might be wondering how in the world do you actually go and compute uh, what decimal is close to E? You know, we can look at the graph and say, yeah, it's probably between two and three, but that's not very specific. Uh, the way you would do it, if you remember Riemann sums, where you go and make a bunch of rectangles, tiny little rectangles. If you use maybe a thousand rectangles between one and two and another thousand between two and three, and you ask the computer to add up the area, you can get a pretty good down to a thousandths of how far you'd have to go over. If you use millionths, computer can do that in probably a minute or less. You can get it down to the millionth digit. So just cut it into trillionths, and maybe that might take all day for a computer, but you can get your answer down to trillionths. Uh, you can, they used to compute this stuff by hand and other fancier ways, with a little bit of cool algebra but now we just use computers to get most of these uh, approximate values. All right, so that takes care of E, the natural base. So let's go ahead and take a derivative. You may know the derivative of the natural log, if you took calculus before, I know I haven't said it, you could open up your calc book and see what they say about derivative natural log. But what we're gonna do to get the derivative, we're not just gonna open our textbook and see what it says. What we're gonna do is take really the only thing we know about natural log, which is it's the integral from one to x, one over t dt. How in the world do I find the derivative of this integral? You have to go way back to Calc 1. What theorem? I could so I could reverse the x in the one and I will get a negative sign. So what is that theorem called that lets us replace the basically replace the t with an x? So there's two fundamental theorems. This is the one your book calls the first fundamental theorem. Uh, let's look back. Let's write down the fundamental theorem of calculus that we're trying to use here. So I think the fundamental theorem, it's been a while. Did it go one? 
don't know if it went A to X or X to A. Somebody had their textbook with them? Got to be in chapter five. Yeah, it was A to X. All right. A to X. So I'm copying this right out of Fundamental Theorem uh, 5.4, right in your textbook. Thanks. All right. We have the same situation, we got a constant down here is the first bound, x is the second bound. So there's really not much work to do at all. We're just going to replace in that function, we're going to replace t by x. That's it right there. So it is f of that uh, x. So any questions on the applying the fundamental theorem? Now, every derivative that you get, you get a free antiderivative with it. So what I'm going to do is every time we get a derivative, I'm also going to write down the antiderivative that we get. So there's a few ways to write it down. One of the ways to think about it, in function notation, what I want to do is move the derivative to the other side. And think about it just like a function. How do I move a function to the other side? It moves as the inverse. So if I want to get this out of here, I would move it over. Now, this is not OK notation to use right there. That's not the inverse of the derivative, the way that we write it. We write it as the antiderivative, which is an integral sign. So that's the inverse derivative, or an antiderivative. And of course, there's a dx at the end as well. And what goes in the middle is the 1 over x. So I just circled the basically the parts that moved. So you can see on the left side, right there, we've got the derivative. It's going to move to the right side, but it jumps over to the right side as an antiderivative, which we denote like that. There is also a plus e for the constant. So we don't want to forget that. Now, there was a, the only actual trick you learned for antiderivatives was u substitution. So because u substitution is really, really popular, it's one of the better uh, more useful tools that you have. It's the only tool you have right now for antiderivatives. I'm going to, instead of writing x's for antiderivatives, I'm going to use the letter u for antiderivatives. So wherever I see an x, I'm going to replace with a u. So we get the antiderivative of 1 over u du is the natural log of u plus c. So there's our free antiderivative that we got with our derivative. So let's do some example problems. So you're going to need to use definitely chain rule on both of these problems. And the second one, you're also going to have to use quotient rule. Well, I shouldn't say you have to use quotient rule, but the way it's written, you would use quotient rule. So I'll give you about three minutes to do these derivatives.
as a good time to build up your formula page if you don't know the quotient rule or the chain rule you can start your your cheat sheet right now Chain rule is the first rule you're applying in both of these problems. So if you're not doing the chain rule first, you're not doing the right thing. So I just did the first chain rule step on the board, if you were stuck on that. So it's the derivative of the natural log of this thing, which is 1 over the thing, times the derivative of the, you're going to the inside part now. So that's the first step of the chain rule. Then the next step is just a regular derivative. Alright, so time flies when you're doing the chain rule, so we're going to have to pick this one back up tomorrow. So I'm going to leave you hanging. <laughs> 